Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kristen Darby. I'll be your facilitator for today's LinkedIn Live. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Russell Velamez, one of our resident experts here at Dialexa, and he's going to share today um, all of his years of experience uh, with portfolio product strategy. Russell has over 25 years of management and tech consultants for some of the biggest industries um, and for some of today's most successful digital product enterprises. We will have about 30 minutes of presentation and followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, we encourage questions. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout and where possible we can answer, stop and answer questions in the middle of the presentation. So with that, um, I look forward to hearing from you, Russell. Okay, great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. I know we have some people maybe overseas and from different time zones in the U.S. So thank you for joining us. I also know that there's quite a few people from, that there are familiar names and faces. Uh, so thank you for joining. Wish we had more time. We could do some one-on-ones to get caught up, but uh, glad you're here. Uh, everybody else, uh, welcome. Um, we are going to be talking about an ebook that um, Dialexa has uh, is publishing. It'll be available uh, for download at the end of uh, the event here. Um, so, but I wanted to do a shout out for some of the people that were involved in helping building this. I'm I'm just the talking head, but there are a lot of people that were involved. First and foremost, Stephanie Payne, Vivek Bijaragavan, my uh, co-authors in this ebook. Um, Abby Morgan, who spent countless hours helping us as the editor and getting our grammar and, uh, and flow down. Um, Ashley Quinn, Sanjay Shah, Kristen Darby, Aubrey Scharf, all these people were very instrumental in actually producing the graphics and building the ebook from our content. Um, and then last but not least, Mark Canada, who was the inspiration for the kind of a stalking horse of how we wrote this, which is setting up a couple of what we call tensions between product level and portfolio level or product level and enterprise level efforts um, as a way to kind of tease out how these two can uh, actually come together and work symbiotically as opposed to at odds, at odds with each other. So uh, with that, let me get into it. And like, like Kristen said, definitely ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A. And then Kristen, if you'll uh, jump in, let me know if I'm running behind schedule or not so I can speed up and make sure we get to cover all the content. I will do my best to keep us on track. All right. All right, so with that, let me go ahead and start. And I can't see anybody now because it's taking up my whole screen, but uh, wanted to first start here with you know, the ebook itself, um, and we'll get into this in a bit. But when I look through some of the people and their titles that uh, are here today, I see people that actually fit in either you know, the left hand column or the right hand column. I see people out there with titles like head of technology, strategy, architecture, CIO, CTO, cross platform, transformation, enterprise. So a lot of people in the room here that kind of fall into that transformational leader column. And then there's a lot of other people that's got titles like innovation and product engineering and product design, digital product, product managers and strategists and head of product. And so there's a lot of people here that also fit in the right-hand column. I didn't actually expect that, but um, maybe they'll make for some interesting questions since uh, the audience here really is coming from these two different points of view. Um, so with that, let me start with, um, you know, as we talk about going from a product or single product approach to how do you handle those things at a portfolio or enterprise level, that's kind of a continuum. So I want to start at the, the side of the continuum at the smallest level, at the most elementary building block, and that's the developer, right? And and by the way, lot, all these things we're going to cover are things that, you know, we hear our clients talking about. So a lot of this is a reflection of our clients, a lot of our counterparts and colleagues and stakeholders at IBM. Um, and so we wanted to share this with a larger community because we felt like this was, you know, some 
relevant topics for us to get into. So starting at that elementary level, we have the idea of the developer, right? A software engineer. And one way to get to value to market faster is to make your developers more productive, right? And if you could baseline, and if you just hired random developers off the street and put them on a team and say, go build a product, you know, they may be down in this bottom circle where they spend a lot of time just trying to figure out who's who and what's what before they're actually putting hands on keyboard and coding. But if you could baseline what that is in your organization, it'd be interesting to see, you know, just exactly where that is and, and can it be improved. And so as a stretch goal, you could say, well, let's try to double that, whatever it is. So if it's 35% of their time today is working on actually building, then how could we get that to 70%, right? And the things on the right-hand side of this picture represent uh, stepping up of maturity levels to standardize before you can automate, you have to standardize before you can integrate. So things that you can do to improve repeatability, you get better estimates. Now you can move people from one team to another and they know what to expect. So you have a more effective workforce. Only then can you then take those processes and approaches and start to automate and integrate them. So things like test automation and RPA, CICD pipelines. This is where we're actually trying to take tasks that used to require a developer and can now be automated. Uh, so taking labor out of the, out of the equation. Um, and then the next step is what I like to call slow down to speed up. Um, so shift left might be another word you could think of here, which is before you just dive in into building, what are some of the things that you can do to make the building process more effective, more productive? And that means doing some design level things up front and identifying common that could become architectural leverage. So product teams don't all have to do this. This is something you can build once for everybody. Um, but the idea here is, you know, slow down, make sure that people can find the stuff that they need to do their work um, and then are leveraging all of those things to be more productive. And then the last step is, you know, these accelerators, things like low code and generative AI and platforms and frameworks, et cetera. And the idea here is really spend less time on plumbing and spend more time on business value. And so as you move from that 35% spent on development to doubling it to 70% working on development, it's not just the same, the same work or the same code doing the same things and you're just cranking out more. It's actually the, the code that they're working on is the most important code. It's the it's not the shells and it's not the you know uh, overhead and housekeeping type code. It's the actual functionality of the product. And so uh, it's not just doubling their productivity. It's also focusing them on the right things and the things that you know humans can do. Okay. Now as we step back from the developer and start to think about how to now build a product, right? So moving from just software the product right is so important to downstream product team. Um, and then the right product, right? Building the, the right product. So that's understanding the customer, the market, the needs that they have those things, you know, as clearly as possible. And so um, as we expand from taking software engineering to the world of product, um, it's no, no longer it's much more of a cross-functional team. So you've got roles like 
designers and product strategists, quality engineers, product owners, scrum masters, et cetera. And these people come together in a product team in a very collaborative way um, to build that product. Um, and, and so it's a lot more than just uh, adopting Agile. Now, what Dialexa does is we take our approach to this idea of product and we call it product digital product engineering and there are a couple of things that are um you know to note about this little graphic here on the right which is you know looks like a thumbprint this is not a process right these think of these as more as capabilities and you can assemble those capabilities in a variety of ways to actually create a playbook for a given uh given product but the three pillars or the three legs of the stool are strategy so that's about you know building the right product development building the product right right and then product performance which is you know ongoing continuous improvement and using data and feedback loops to improve the performance of the product after it's been uh launched into the wild and so um it's a maturity level that comes you know after you've worked on the developer and then the product team and then now you can kind of start to formalize the capabilities that the product team brings to the table as they work the product okay now let's say you've got not just one product but a portfolio of products and by portfolio can mean a lot of different things but a, another word you might think of here is you know an ecosystem um, so this is a picture of amazon's product ecosystem. Google has theirs, Apple has theirs. You know, the point would be that these are not standalone products. These products all operate and address market needs in a way that's completely cognizant of the fact that there are other products in that ecosystem. So you don't have products stepping on each other's toes or working cross purposes um, so there are a lot of reasons to think about products at a portfolio level. Now, depending on the industry, depending on the specific specifics of your company, you may not have, you know, this many products. You may not have this degree of uh, interaction between or, you know, shared components across these products. But if you really think about your ecosystem, including looking upstream and what comes inbound into your company in terms of supply chain, what's outbound in terms of channel partners and customers, and think of that entire left to right value chain as an ecosystem, um, I'll bet you'll find some reasons to start to begin to address portfolio level strategies as opposed to product specific strategies. So I would encourage you all to think about your own companies here, say, what would my version of this little picture look like? Um, when you start to do this at scale, and so now you may be talking dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of products and some of the larger enterprises that are out there, there's a whole new set of concerns that as an individual product owner or product manager, you're really not paying it that much attention to. It's not important. Um, but when you zoom out and look at these collectively, you can see, you know, there's interfaces so interaction between these products and those interactions would cross multiple user experiences so how do you get a common user experience across all of these products at a portfolio level pretty sure that when you guys are using some of these amazon products it's very clear that these are amazon products and that there's a common user experience that uh, synchronizes and harmonizes these together so Inconsistent user experiences are a very common phenomena out there that we see when we get to a portfolio level. The, um, these products are usually built at different times, different eras using different technologies. And so the number of point to point interfaces not only grows exponentially every time you add a new product to this mix, but the way in which that integration is done is different. So different, you know, depends on when these, some of these things were built. We still find things out there that are decades old. Uh, especially in large established companies. <clears throat> um, all of these products are, you know, purportedly using data, consuming data, producing data. So you, you need to now start looking at, 
Do we have the same data being touched by all of these products? And are we uh, affecting a single source of truth about that given data item? Like, for example, a 360 degree view of the customer. Um, it also makes it very difficult to automate back to that developer picture that I started with. It's very difficult to automate DevSecOps at scale if each of these products are using different platforms and different technologies and different containers, et cetera. So getting some modern uh, integration architectures and some standard platforms. So this is where we can start to distinguish between what's a product versus what, what's a platform. So a platform would be the common components that each of these products would be hosted on top of. Uh, and those can be you know, just as basic as infrastructure um, or get a little more sophisticated, like in the case of an actual e-commerce uh, platform play. Um, and then, you know, there's all different ways that uh, these teams are building these products. So the way they use Agile, the way they um, think about product management can be different. Um, all of those things need to be kind of harmonized. And so things like shared design systems and um, even retiring some of these products. There's often a lot of technical debt. The worst kind of technical debt that's out there is in the form of a whole product that just needs to be retired or replaced because it's redundant with something newer. So um, all of these things that I'm referring to are not things that individual product teams normally concern themselves with because they're so focused on their customer and their market and their, their strategy. Um, but at a portfolio level, there's a whole new set of issues and, and topics that have to be have to be discussed. Um, now, um, going back to that inconsistent user experiences, I'm going to go ahead and transition now to the what's in the ebook uh, when you guys get to download this. So you'll see here in parts two, three, and four, we tease out a couple of different tensions. So this is tension. That, that gets created between a product team and the portfolio or enterprise level that it's a part of. And so there's some financial tensions, some functional tensions, like for example, what should determine the functional scope of a given product when you're looking at it at a portfolio level? Should the other products have a role to play in defining the scope of this other product? Um, operational tensions. and. If you know, if you were, if I were to count up, there's probably dozens of tensions that we call out with dozens of solutions uh, that go with them. But today, uh, in this event, I'm just going to talk about a few of them. So I'm going to pull out um, maybe I'm going to pull out one tension to give you an example of what we mean by a tension, and then I'm going to share three different solutions without necessarily revealing the tension behind them. But um, so you get a feel for the kind of advice and insight that we're providing in the rest of the ebook. <clears throat> okay, so let's take functional attention as, as the one to illustrate. And um, I'm going to use an example here from an airline and from the you know air, airline industry. It's really easy because most people have flown and they've experienced these. They've had an experience of checking in and getting them on an airplane and losing your baggage and getting weather delays and all that kind of stuff. So it's a really easy one for people to relate to. But the storyline here is that, you know, if you think about um, how many apps or products will each of you access and use and experience just today in the span of a, a given day. And chances are you're using lots of different products. Um, and so, you know, is there a lot of friction between how you go from one product to another? Um, in the case of employees, especially frontline, frontline operational employees, it's very rare that they're only using one product or one application over the course of the day. Now, maybe if you're in, you know, sales and marketing, you spend most of your life in Salesforce, or if you're in finance, you spend most of your life in SAP or Oracle. Um, but most frontline and operational employees are you know, subjected to lots of products and lots of user experiences. Um, and then, of course, we have cus the customers themselves where uh, their experience with a product is being influenced by other people. Some of those frontline uh, and operations 
employees at your company. Their experiences with the products they use is influencing the product experience of the customer. So, if, you know, if you look at the middle band there, it says the passenger experience. Well, that passenger experience is heavily impacted by what the gate agent is doing at the at the gate and in what the baggage handler is doing, you know, in the baggage bays. So um, if you were to only take each one of these separately and, uh, you know, use traditional product mindset, you're the using design thinking, right? Trying to get to the heart of what is that particular user, customer, employee, et cetera, really need to get their job done. Um, but doing it in a way that takes into account the interaction between multiple personas and multiple products requires a little bit of systems thinking. And so you need a mechanism to be able to work out the details of how do these things interact with each other, um, not just from a UX design perspective, but from a process automation and, and how these things integrate with each other. <clears throat> so that's an example of the kind of functional tensions that we we talk about in the ebook. There's a, a few more, but this is this was one of them is user experience. If all you looked at was the UX, right? There's some opportunities to apply some systems thinking to how you how you do those. Now I'm going to go through a couple of the uh, solutions that that we propose. So one of them, and this is in the area of financials, is the you know the bane of most of our existence is the project. Right. And the annual project gauntlet that usually happens. So usually starts with someone has an idea for a project. Someone else has another idea for a project. Hey, I got an idea for a project. And pretty soon you got a list of projects queued up for some organization to go through and start to prioritize and decide what we're going to do. And um, those projects are usually stepping on each other's toes. They're actually building things the same different ways, but they're building the same thing without even knowing that they're building the same thing because these organizations don't talk to each other. It's a divide and conquer approach. Um, so this is like the old way of doing it where the ROI for a project or, you know, the right executive with, a, with the loudest voice in the room can often influence what gets prioritized and what gets funding. But uh, that typically doesn't result in speed to market doesn't necessarily result in the right things doing being done a better way to do that is to fund products and fund at a, at a lower grain within the product fund capabilities and um, we can have a whole nother discussion about what a business capability is but hopefully there's some architects business architects out there that are doing some capability capability modeling and i would say use that as a way to change the dialogue about funding projects to funding capabilities. And now if, when you can talk about the value, the business value that a capability brings to the market, it's a much better language to have about how do we get speed to value in the form of capabilities as opposed to speed to completion of these projects, you know, which doesn't necessarily translate into value for the market or for the customer. So we're a big fan of, um, of using capabilities and a capability model that, that encompasses the entire portfolio so that you can have that discussion about which capabilities should each product be responsible for implementing and which ones they shouldn't. And what is the right value that we get from each of these capabilities? Can we measure that and use that to decide what to fund in the current period, in the next period, in the period after that? So that's, that's solution number four in the financial area. There's obviously uh, three that came before this, if you get their ebook. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is shaping demand or, or demand shaping. So, uh, you know, if you go back far enough, you know, it used to be that a product organization, a IT organization, uh, the CIO, the CTO, et cetera, didn't even have a seat at the table from a corporate strategy perspective. Their, their mantra was more likely to be, I, I, captain, you know, whatever you want me to do, we'll go do. Um, and then over time, you know, as technology became a lot more um, critical and uh, integral to company success, 
um, they began to get a seat at the table. But you know, often it became more as the arbiter of everybody else's needs. So um, you know, what typically would end up is that executive would have to actually present their plan. So here's my plan, and my plan is a combination of all the other things that BU VPs and presidents, et cetera, have all asked for, and I'm taking my best shot at how to weave these things together. But it, you know, it's still pretty much a, here's my plan as opposed to here's our plan. And then what we really need to be doing now is collaborating, first of all, collaborating and getting alignment between both business and product or business and IT, you know, architecture, et cetera, um, and agreeing on the value of those capabilities and the sequence in which those capabilities should be developed. So if you, if you go all the way back to the left-hand side of this graphic, this is the world of, you know, the tyranny of the project. Um, and it's just a list of projects in a queue and we get to however many we can get to, to fast forward to today where we really need to be talking about capabilities. Now, once you're there, you can start to, in that conversation with the business, have the trade-offs discussed about what should be, uh, what should be done first, second, third, or more likely, We've got two different organizations needing the same capability. Maybe we should build that first because it has a common uh, common value. And so that's a dialogue. That's a uh, you have to have a seat at that table at the executive level, having that dialogue to establish um, the build sequence using that language of capabilities. Right. And if you can do that. Uh, you can usually turn something that might otherwise be a five-year plan into a four-year plan because you will build things faster. If you build things redundantly and try to figure it out at the back end, it takes a lot longer than if you build things with an eye towards the overall portfolio architecture to begin with. Right? So you save time. So a five-year plan can become a four-year plan. Four-year plan can become a three-year plan. Et cetera. Now, some of you guys may be thinking, why are you talking about a five or four or even a two-year plan? plan when most of everything I'm talking about is agile and speed to market, et cetera. I mean, that five-year plan usually conjures up waterfall. But I would say, you know, go look at your company's uh, P&L and look for the line for depreciation. And that number is, represents decisions made in the past about investment in something that is expected to have a longer shelf life than a single year, certainly longer than a single sprint. So. Some companies are very capital intensive and that number is really big. Some are not, or services industries, for example. But there's always this element of you can't just make plans at the corporate level one sprint at a time. You do think about things in one, two, three, four, five year increments. And so um, that's why this is that's why this is in here is because we definitely see that at our clients. Um, companies, you know, making big capital investment decisions um, over a three, five year period. So therefore, as a portfolio and a product strategy, you should be trying to align to that same time horizon while implementing things in an incremental agile way. So you could think of that as, you know, thinking and planning and architecting in the large while still implementing in the small. Okay. Uh, the last operational uh, solution I wanted to talk about is the org structure. Um, so you, if you're, you know, you've got a product team and they're doing really well and you want to start expanding what they're doing to some other product teams, you're going to be creating these different verticals. And what's missing until you can get to a matrix structure are the platforms that cut across these products. So infrastructure, data, common UX, et cetera. Those would be the horizontals in this matrix picture, right? Um, the other thing this helps do is localize where most of the uh, conflicts and gaps need to be worked out. They happen at the intersections of horizontals and verticals. In the old hierarchical structure, you'd have to work your way up the chain and then back down another branch in the org chart to get things resolved. So this allows you to actually be a lot quicker 
in getting a resolution because the issues typically reside at the intersection of a product and a horizontal, right? And so it promotes collaboration, it promotes empowerment, and uh, certainly it promotes speed to market. Okay, so that's the um, that's the sneak peek that I wanted to give uh, on the ebook. There's a lot of other topics that are in there. There's dozens of them. I've listed a few over here to the right. Some of them may be a little controversial, um, but you would find um, our point of view on each one of these in there. And I want to end up on um, you know the very last one there called leadership because often what's required to pull these types of things off uh, is a, you need help. Um, you know, a lot of the time the leadership that you would want running some of these things are the very people who are busy doing day-to-day -day stuff. So how do we pull them out of day-to-day -to, -day to do a little bit of planning and shifting left and slowing down to speed up and those types of things. Um, but you've got to somehow find leadership within your organization to drive this. This doesn't happen bottoms up. It's got to have some top down leadership and then, you know, needing help. So consulting companies like IBM and Dialux, et cetera, are certainly here to help. Um, we can, you know, expand that leadership capability inside your teams. But um, you guys may end up being in various points along the maturity continuum. May only have you know a single product and a single product engineering team, in which case you know that's a dip for us. That's all about digital product engineering. You may be at the enterprise level and you're trying to solve five-year problems with your you know the future of your company, and that would be the things on the left that we call enterprise product transformation. In each of these cases, um, we have lots of detail um, playbooks. A variety of delivery techniques that we use um, for each of these, but the idea here is, you know, we want to get you from being really good at product to being really good at product at scale, and we want to be able to meet you where you are. And I feel like um, Alex is, a, you know, and IBM is definitely able to do that with these two different playbooks that we have. Okay, so. That's uh, that was it. I do want to uh, again thank Kristen and Stephanie and Vivek uh, for helping to write the ebook. There's a QR code here in the upper left hand corner that you can scan uh, to get a link to download it. Hope you all guys do that. It's um, you know it's probably a weekend read, um, <laughs> not too long. But it's uh, it's dense. I'll put it that way. We tried our best to put lots of examples and anecdotes, and you know, not just make a statement, but back it up and uh, with examples. So um, it's a good read. All right, Kristen, I'll turn it over to yes. you. To get some thank questions. you, Russell. and thank you for taking the time to share your point of view uh, on product and portfolio strategy. Uh, as Russell said, yes, we do have a very large ebook. You're welcome to go and download that. Uh, it is not a light read. It is actually chock full of great solutions. I think there's dozens of solutions to common problems that we hear from our clients all the time um, that they're, everyone's trying to solve. So, uh, you know, take a, take a look. Uh, maybe we can uh, give you a couple solutions to take back to your organizations. Um, with that being said, I, there haven't been any questions in the chat, so we can uh, move to wrap this up today. Um, but if there's anyone quickly who wants to ask a question, I'll give you uh, 10 seconds or so to put something in the um, comment or chat section. In the meantime, I will say, uh, while we wait for questions, Russell is right. This was a community effort. I, I can't even begin to tell you how many years of experience were put into the pages of this ebook. So if you are struggling with portfolio and or product development, this is a really good resource to go and gain some perspective and some expertise from top leaders at this space. All right, well, with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and close the session out. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's able to join today and uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Russell if you have any questions and now or in the future. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining.